Thank you, Andrew and Carrie and Karen, for leading us this morning. At this time, uh, children are able to go out for junior church, ages 5 to 12, and I just encourage you parents to go along with them uh, to sign them in. We're going to take some time to uh, pray now. And uh, just uh, some good news, I think. Uh, Ivan had his surgery. Uh, he'd been waiting a while for that, but he got it, uh, friends of uh, Karen and Jamie. And uh, he's doing well. The surgery went well. He's doing well. So just continue to pray for them and for their, uh, his recovery. Um, it's probably going to take some time for him to recover. So that is uh, good news. Let us pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can pray in your name and that we can come with confidence uh, before the throne of grace. Lord, uh, your word even tells us in Romans 8 that when we are facing those very difficult things and we don't know how to put into words those things that are impressed deeply upon us, that your Holy Spirit is able to take those things that we cannot even express and put it in words on our behalf and bring them to you. Because you know us so well. You know the things we struggle with. You know our deepest longings. You know the challenges that we face. And you and your love uh, so graciously receive the prayers that we bring before you because you are a great and awesome God. A God who has shown his love to generation after generation after generation. A God who desires to communicate with us, to encourage and to strengthen us. And we thank you that you are the God who answers prayer. Lord, it's not always what we intend or what we desire. But you are always answering prayer. And even as we pray to you, you are able to use that to shape our hearts and to shape our minds. And you're able to take those difficult things in our lives and draw us closer to you. And to conform us more to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And while those experiences may be difficult to go through, uh, you promise us that there is good and that good comes in the strengthening and deepening and maturing of our faith. Lord, we bring uh, before you a number of things. Lord, we thank you for uh, Ivan, that he has been able to get his uh, heart surgery, that it has gone well. We pray for his recovery, Lord, and that uh, you would just use uh, believers just to speak into their lives, to encourage them and to uh, help them, Lord, to see you. Lord, we uh, continue to pray for uh, just this church family, and I thank you so much for that. And Lord, I pray that as we continue to seek your face, uh, that this church will have an influence in this community. Lord, we thank you for all of those that we are able to help through our food pantry. We've had a large uh, number of people over the last few months who have come just who don't have enough money to put food on the table and we're able to help them in a small way and to build relationships and connections. And Lord, may we be a strong witness for you through that ministry. Lord, help us to be a strong witness for you uh, in our workplaces, in uh, our families, in our community, to those who work at the grocery store that we go to when we go and put gas in our car. Lord, that you would just give us a heart to see people as you see them, and that you would open doors for us to uh, share the gospel. And Lord, that there would just be uh, a love and a joy uh, that people will sense in us because we know you. Lord, I want to pray for the number of churches in our region who are looking for pastors. Uh, there are uh, many of them, almost 40. And Lord, I just pray that you will connect them with good pastors, with uh, biblically sound pastors who will preach your word unapologetically, who will give good leadership to those churches. 
and continue to pray, Lord, that uh, we would find men who would go into the ministry. There is a shortage right now of pastors, and not only in our region, but also uh, across this nation. And we need men to hear your call and to respond to it and to take that step uh, in faith. Lord, that you would just raise up those individuals. And as a result, that we would see strong churches with strong leadership and healthy pastors who would make an impact on a community of believers and the community of non-believers. Lord, that you would just strengthen your church across this nation. That we would be bold and we would be fearless in our preaching of the gospel. And Lord, that we would see lives changed. And that is the heartbeat in our church. That we would see people saved. That we would see people baptized. That we would see people discipled. And that we would just have a sense of unity in our fellowship. Uh, A true and deep and rich love for one another. As we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we know that the community of Brantford faces a lot of challenges. We know that uh, drugs plague our streets and destroy lives. We know that there is an increasing number of uh, people who face homelessness, not just in Brantford, but they're seeing that in a number of cities uh, across our province. Lord, we know that There are many, many broken lives, and we would just ask that churches across this city would rise up, would recognize those needs, meet those needs, and share the gospel. Lord, that is what we need. We need clear, clear proclamation of your word, and we would ask that that would happen. I thank you that we are uh, here today and that we have this opportunity to gather. Let us never take that for granted. Lord, we pray as uh, Dan comes to share about fair and to share from the word that you would just speak through him, that you would use him to challenge and to encourage us about what you are doing uh, around the world through fair. We pray these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Well, it is a a great privilege for me to have Dan come and speak. I met Dan way back in Little Britain. Uh, He came and spoke at uh, one of our association meetings. And uh, Dan has become the director of FAIR and doing a great job. And I'm just so grateful that he is here. Let's give a warm welcome to Dan Scher. Okay, good, good. Well, good morning. I hope everyone is doing well, and uh, I'm feeling very welcome, my wife and I, this morning. Uh, Thanks for the invitation, uh, Pastor Andrew, and and, uh, just being able to uh, share with you. Uh, My purpose this morning is to share a brief update about the Ministry of Fellowship Aid and International Relief, and then we'll look into God's Word together and uh, uh, trust God for good things there. So um, I need to get on to this here. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Fair mission is to um, alleviate human suffering and social injustice around the world and do that in the name of Christ. Um, so this morning, um, we, uh, I just would share that we do this in a number of ways. This image uh, shows you uh, my colleague Paul Hildebrand and myself. We're in uh, western Ukraine, about uh, five kilometers from the... Uh, sorry, we're in Poland, about five kilometers uh, from Ukraine. And uh, we're, we're loading trucks with supplies, these uh, huge, large sprinter vans with uh, groceries and food for the Ukraine people. I want to say thank you to your church family. Uh, you raised funds uh, to help with this. And um, 
uh, just just so encouraged that uh, we could support and, and help in all of this. So we do this by disaster relief. Uh, when disasters occur around the world, uh, we work through our, our missionary families that are on the ground or through trusted partners uh, to get to the grassroots, to get to local churches. And this is what is being done in the Ukraine. Network of uh, Baptist churches in the Ukraine are coming to pick up this food and uh, it's benefiting them. We have longer aid programs. So what started as a, a, an invasion in Ukraine has gone on for <clears throat> excuse me many months where we see um, tremendous benefit coming to help these people get through a very uh, difficult cold winter. We have development programs. I'll talk a little bit about that and um, that's really where we see the uh, boys' home in Lebanon, uh, Cedar Home. It actually started as a girls' home, and now it's uh, the prospects of this uh, building being refurbished to be a boys' home as well. And then I'd like to talk about uh, child sponsorship, which uh, we have five locations. We'll get to that in just a moment. So uh, the Ukraine refugee crisis has been quite a deal since February 2022. And uh, responding to the enormous needs of this refugee crisis, we have uh, used money that has been donated uh, to support the lo uh, work of local churches in Poland. Uh, churches that have stepped up to the plate and have provided uh, housing uh, for refugees flooding into the country. Uh, have also provided care, and uh, we met with some of these churches and thanked them especially for uh, doing this work. And then, as I mentioned, by sending food aid into Ukraine to support church partners who are caring for displaced people in their communities. Think of this. Your church, along with 500 plus other churches across Canada, contributed since February 2022 $2.1 million for this. That's never happened before. And uh, so we praise God for the generosity and for the care. Now, for a fuller report, on the table at the back, look for the um, UK, Ukraine refugee crisis report. It's there. You can take it and read it. Our missionaries in Poland, Ben and Krista Taylor, uh, they've been serving in the country as uh, team leaders for this emergency response. They have been top-notch. And uh, Krista is providing logistical support. Um, it was very interesting to me as we went there. I'm like, well, okay, you're crossing the border. Yeah. And they showed me an app that they had on their phones and it showed all of the hot spots where conflict was happening, where bombings were taking place. They said, we don't go there. So I said, well, what do you do? Well, we go to the border. We've gained favor with the customs guards. So they move us through the, the border crossing in, a, in an efficient fashion. And then they said, we go about a kilometer across the border and then we make a left. We go into a grove of trees and there's a farmhouse. And all of the uh, networks of churches come to the farmhouse, pick up the supplies, and God's people are blessed. So uh, they have been a huge help to us uh, in the Ukraine. I'd like to talk a little bit about our child sponsorship program. It really started uh, in September of 2019 started with uh, Children's Home in Honduras. That's kind of been the leading site. Uh, Missionary Lee's, uh, uh, Melody Francis. And the program um, really uh, takes children, uh, $35 a month is, is what we're asking people to give. Take a child, support them, and um, so these are the two of the um, residential homes. I mentioned Honduras, that's Casa Ogar, it means house home, and Cedar Home in Lebanon. It's uh, a home for girls, but we're hoping that very soon 
it can be also a home for boys. We also have homes in Sri Lanka, Love Trust Ministries, and your missionary of the month, uh, Rula and Bashara Karkafi, operate the Clementia Learning Center in Beirut. And so um, these are, are great facilities. I've visited each of them. Uh, Love Trust, sorry, the newest uh, location is um, Joy Foundation. It's in Dominican Republic. It came on stream in May of 2022. It's our fifth location. And we have a number of children that still need to be sponsored there. You can see some of the cards if you'd like to sponsor one. Let us know, and we'd be happy to set you up with that. Um, <clears throat> these are children that are offered a, a hot meal, and uh, as a result of getting one hot meal a day, um, it increases their attention span in school, and their marks go up, and they achieve more, and I just see that as a great win for the gospel. So not only are they getting education, as you'll see in this slide, uh, they get f physical benefits of having a roof over their heads. Otherwise, they're in the streets finding shelter. Um, they get medical care, access to much-needed medical care, and just a place to call home where they can do fun activities with other kids. There's emotional support. Do you realize when a child is supported, let me tell you this, the kids at Casa Ogar, when they know that there's a sponsor and they know that the sponsor's praying for them, every night they gather for devotions and they pray for the sponsor, whoever their sponsor is. It's incredible. And they receive the gospel the gospel is given out, they're taken to church, and so there's the spiritual component as well. Let me take a moment to talk about our, our newest initiative that's been happening this uh, last number of months. It's called Together for Freedom. We are um, working with two organizations, uh, International Justice Mission Canada and uh, Bridge North. So uh, International Justice Mission uh, is helping to end online sexual exploitation of really, really little children in the Philippines. You say, well, what, what do you mean? It's the dark world of people going onto a website, could be people here in Canada, the US, or in Germany, and uh, little children are trapped into a, a life of displaying things that are unthinkable. Uh, and it's all done online. And the perpetrators and the, the violators are being caught. Over 1,000 apprehensions to stop this because we've been supporting the ministry of IJM in the Philippines. Bridge North is local, it's Ontario based, but it's a nationwide ministry, survivor-led organization committed to ending the uh, sexual exploitation of young women here in Canada. And I know we sometimes think, no, that's not happening around us. Yes, it is. It's in every community in Canada and uh, as believers in Christ, this is my feeling, we need to step up and speak for those that don't have a voice. And we need to advocate for them. And so um, Bridge North has been involved in setting policy with our government, uh, setting policy that says it's wrong. And uh, we need to see more and more of this. Now, in the... Um, New market area, the school boards are given curriculum that will um, encourage teachers to uh, have signs when they think someone is getting entrapped into sexual exploitation. Uh, 
you know, they might have a new cell phone all of a sudden. They might have new, a new purse. And, and so there are telltale signs or they're not showing up for school. But they're getting entrapped into a life of, of uh, this sexual exploitation. We, we can have a say in that. And, and by contributing and giving to Together for Freedom, we trust that uh, we would begin to stem the tide in all our communities across Canada. That's a bit of an update. You'll find more information back about sponsorship on the table there, about the Ukraine report. Please take it. It means I don't have to take it home with me. Okay? Be happy for you to have that. Uh, this is actually a video. It's not working for us this morning, but you can go online and watch it. It's called Together for Freedom. Explains the whole uh, initiative. So let's look into uh, God's Word together this morning. Uh, we're going to turn to John chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 8. If you'll find that in your Bible, I'd like to read that with you this morning. John 12, uh, 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet uh, uh, with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now, he didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. So a question that I'm frequently asked as I make uh, fair presentations is, okay, Dan, what comes first? Is it the gospel or is it good deeds? Sort of a trick question. So I'd like to share some points that Sandy Wilson, uh, a recent speaker at one of our pastor's conference, shared. I, I found them very, very encouraging. He said this, you know, we must be concerned with all human need, but especially the eternal need, our sin problem. Deeds of mercy must be coupled with gospel proclamation. And so he explained it like this. He, he said it's kind of like the, the pointy thing, the prow of a ship. The prow of the ship is gospel proclamation. But the ship doesn't come empty. The gospel ship is full of deeds of love and kindness. And so as we share Christ with people, as we share the hope of the gospel with people, we are contributing to things like, is it Roger Boyd's ministry? We're providing meals. We're, we're providing to um, the food bank. These are visible signs that the gospel has touched our hearts. And we're in turn sharing uh, with others. God bless you for doing what you're doing in this way. Let's just ask God to bless his word and help us this morning as we share. Heavenly Father, grateful for this church family. Grateful for your word to our hearts this morning. Spirit of God, would you take the word of God and bless the people of God, I pray today in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So Easter sort of recalibrates us, doesn't it? You know, we, we go through uh, a whole year and then Easter comes with Good Friday, the Holy Week, and all of the things, and it sort of is like, yes, this is what it's all about. And uh, I'd like to retrace just a little bit this morning, um, that week leading up uh, to Jesus' passion. So six days before he was to be betrayed and brutally murdered, his disciples and Jesus stop in a place called Bethany. And uh, we find the significance because Bethany was a location where Lazarus lived and where Mary and Martha lived. These were dear friends of Jesus. And so as they stop in Bethany, a dinner party is thrown in Jesus' honor. You say, okay, well, why would they do that? Well, go back to chapter 11 and something pretty important happens. Do you recall what happened to Lazarus in chapter 11? Well, that doesn't happen every day. And so Lazarus is raised from the dead. He had died. And, and uh, you know, recall the whole story in John chapter 11 where, you know, they send out a party and they say, come and if you'll, if you'll just come here, Jesus, you'll... You'll hear Lazarus, and he's very sick, and he could die, and Jesus purposefully says, it's okay, uh, I'm not going to rush there. And that just absolutely blows our minds. We're like, well, he has the power to heal. He's known to do this. Does that mean he doesn't love them? Why would he delay? And so we go through this whole thing in John chapter 11 where Jesus really pushes to the point of saying, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Where he says, I'm the resurrection of life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Do you believe this? And so it touches our lives because we think, well, Jesus, you know, only if, you, if you'd only showed up and answered my prayer, you know, like right now, don't you see what I'm going through? And he says, do you believe this? And so he's saying to us, as he did to Mary and Martha, I'm coming. I am the resurrection and the life. And so, cut a long story short, he tells Lazarus to come out of the grave. It's funny, we have two little, uh, two little granddaughters. They're beautiful, Laura and Lennon. And uh, the oldest, Alora, this Easter said, Jesus came out of the cave. I said to my daughter, you know, that's right. He did. And so Lazarus came out of his tomb, and uh, it's just a remarkable thing. You know, it's not every day that people are raised from the dead. And so you can see the reason. Okay, Jesus is in town. Let's put on a great feast for him. Can you imagine the aroma of special things cooking? Just the, the wonderful smell of food cooking, and they wanted to be the very best. He just healed their brother, Mary and Martha. Raised him to life. And so we know that Martha's doing all the work, so to speak, and then Mary takes this pound of expensive ointment from pure nard, and she anoints Jesus. She pours out this valuable earthly possession to honor him in a beautiful act of worship. So she sees Jesus as her most valuable earthly treasure, surpassing anything that she has in the world. 
So 10 years wages, that's, that's a lot. Okay, so there's the aroma of food cooking in the home. Then Mary breaks open this bottle of perfume and there's another fragrance that's filling the room. It's this expensive perfume. Okay. Scene change. Great juxtaposition here. Judas has a problem with this. And so not only is there the aroma of food, there's the smell of the fragrance of the perfume. I would suggest there's a bad odor in the room. It's the bad attitude of Judas. You can sense his frustration, his annoyance. He says the ointment... It's about a year's wages, could have been sold and given to the poor. I guess on a practical level, you say, well, you know what? He's right. You could do a lot of good with that much money. But it's not his practical arguing. It's what comes next in the text. He said this, not really because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to put his hand into it and use what was there. So he may have put on a holy front, but he didn't love the poor. He loved money. And so it was to support his own agenda. So this reminds us this morning that not everyone who appears to have faith actually possesses a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I can't say that too quickly. I underline that with you, and as, a, as a, a young person, it was driven home to me that, you know, you'd never go into your parents' bathroom and take one of their toothbrushes and, and start brushing your teeth with, with their toothbrush. Why? Because you have to have your own. And when it comes to faith in Christ, you need to own it. It needs to be personal. It needs to be yours. You can't live on your parents' faith. Or maybe you're coming and you like it here at this church, but you've come with a friend. That's okay, but you can't live on your friend's faith. It has to be your own. It needs to mean something to you. Settle that. An old writer, J.C. Ryle, put it this way, a cold heart and a stingy heart usually go together. And then Jesus gives us one of his most uh, uh, incredible statements in this text. This is where we're going to be for a few moments. He says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial, for the poor you always have with you but you do not always have me. So Jesus doesn't enter in with Judas' way of thinking. He turns it around. He says, listen, the poor are always going to be here with you, but you don't always have me. So I need to ask the question, does this mean it's okay to have kind of a carefree attitude about those in need? Homeless people, poor people. Kind of be cavalier about it. Well, yeah, they're always around, so why bother? Is that what Jesus is saying here? I don't think so. And so Mark includes this point, I believe, to say this. We will have plenty of opportunities to do good to the poor. We always have the poor. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to show that we're followers of Christ by giving, by caring, by loving, by doing the things that your church is practicing. Yet some people still see this phrase, the poor you always have with you, as kind of fatalistic. And they say, well, you know, these people are always going to be poor. So why should we bother? They don't don't help themselves. 
pretty judgmental. Maybe the problem comes down to a misunderstanding of what's expected of us. And so I understand Jesus to say, I'll never be able to eliminate poverty. I'll never be able to help uh, uh, end the drug problem in Brantford. Therefore, uh, this uh, person that I'm referring to here um, has the, the mindset, you know, if these people are always here, my ministry to them is such that as long as I'm living and I have breath, I'll do what Jesus has called me to do and I'll help who I can. Might not take all the people off the street. Might not help all the the kids that are homeless around the world. But I can do my part and that's what Christ calls us to. Pastor in the... uh, the projects of Cleveland, Ohio, made this statement. My mission isn't to get rid of the poor or to get rid of all these problems. My ministry is to minister to people who are suffering from these things while they're here and while I'm able. And so um, I just want to point out that Jesus' words are very freeing to us. They're freeing in this way. It, it, it takes us away from that guilt feeling that there's poverty around us. I mean, the obvious response for many of us is when we see people in need, a homeless person, whatever it is, is to turn away. We don't like to see it. We don't like to know that there's poverty in the streets of Brantford. We don't like to know that there's sexual exploitation going on in our communities in Canada. We'd like to believe otherwise. It's not the case. So, if we were to uh, understand Jesus' words as dismissing the needs of the poor, we're mistaken. Because we would have to dismiss countless numbers of Scripture texts that speak against that. At the same time, we shouldn't dismiss these words as merely being for Jesus' immediate hearers. It would be to ignore sin's ongoing problem uh, for us today. And so as long as sin continues, on the face of the earth, there's going to be poverty, there's going to be spiritual, material, and relational problems and sin. So knowing that Jesus is the only one who can truly end poverty frees us from guilt over this continued existence until Jesus returns. And the day is coming when Jesus will end poverty forever. But it won't be necessarily through us. We just have our part to play. Secondly, uh, Jesus' words are are freeing um, in the sense that it frees us to love the poor in an unconditional fashion. And what I mean by that is there are no conditions. Because the obvious one that comes to mind is, well, this person is just going to spend it on drugs. You know, I gave this person money and now they have a, a big screen TV. That's not our decision. Christ calls us to share and show his love. And so these words free us to love unconditionally. Leave it with Jesus. Say, here's one more opportunity, Lord. You do with it as you see fit. I'm just responding because your spirit has called me to do that. And finally, Jesus' words free us to worship him joyfully as we care for the poor. Ultimately, caring for the poor is a worship issue. Did you think of that? 
And we worshiped and sang uh, beautiful songs this morning. Thank you for leading us. But do you also realize that caring for the poor is worshiping? You say, well, how so? Well, it's the true worship of God. It's the proof of our salvation. We're doing that as a sign of our love for him and our love for each other. So it's no coincidence that Jesus spoke of service to him and service to the poor in the same breath. This real-time physical service to the poor is a form of real-time physical service to Jesus. Do you believe that? If not, read Matthew 25. A parable is told there. It's the parable of the sheep and goats. And the king gathers everyone together and the story goes and the questions are asked. Uh, when did we see you in prison or naked or without food or cold or hungry? when you do it to the least of these. And so, when the end of time comes, wouldn't it be nice to say, Lord, I responded because you gave me so many opportunities to respond to the poor because you placed them all around me. Don't get caught in the numbers game of saying, well, how many came to Christ? That's the spirit of God's work. We're just told to share Christ. In sh in including the plan of salvation, but including finance, including food, in in including a hug. And so Jesus goes on in that story in Matthew 25 to say, whenever you visited me in prison, whenever you fed me, whenever you came and encouraged me. Folks, I hope I can raise your vision to the point of realizing that caring for needs around the globe, whether it's uh, helping little kids who are trapped in this terrible thing in the Philippines, young women here in Canada, sponsoring a child around the world, it's an opportunity that we can have to minister to Christ. And I pray today that your church will continue as you have to support the ministry of FAIR. You'll continue to be blessed as you reach out and uh, touch the hearts of people in your community. And so this morning, so, so grateful for uh, being able to share the ministry of FAIR and the gospel of, of uh, Christ with you this morning. Thank you. Well, it's just a reminder, prayer meeting tonight, 6.30, uh, in the youth room, come and be a part of that, please. Also, thank you, Dan, for coming, sharing about FAIR. I hope that you're encouraged with just the work that is being done uh, around the world uh, through FAIR, and we have been a part of that, so thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the reminder that we have just sung uh, the call to be strong and of good courage to take heart because the Lord our God is with us, and how Oh, how wonderful a reminder that is, that you are there with us through all things, every day of the week, 24-7. And Lord, we are grateful for that. And when we are engaged in the battle, that not only have you uh, given us your armor, but Lord, you have assured us of the victory. So may we stand firm and may we stand faithful. Uh, may we do those things that we can do as Dan has pointed out. We can't do it all, but we can do our part. We can do something. 
And if we all do something, then great things will be accomplished for the kingdom as you work through us. Lord, I pray for the ministry of fair. I thank you that they are able to respond in emergency situations, whether that's through uh, helping in the Ukraine, through churches in Poland, whether that is uh, being helpful in Syria when the earthquake hit and in Turkey, or whether that's been being helpful in Lebanon through the many tragedies that that nation has faced. And whether it's connecting with ministries like IJ, uh, IJM and Bridge North to save children in the Philippines from sexual exploitation, to save people in Canada from sexual exploitation. We thank you for the opportunity of child sponsorship and we thank you for the, the five locations where girls and boys are given hope a place to live, a food to eat, education, and they hear about Jesus Christ, and their lives can be transformed. We thank you for the missionaries that are on the field in those locations and the work that they are doing. Lord, we pray that you will just continue to work through fair and powerful ways where people's needs are met, their souls are touched. We pray that hearts will be reached through that. So bless Dan and his team. Just thank you for uh, the fellowship and the work that they do and the leadership that we have as part of our denomination. May we continue to pray for them. And Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for the generosity that has been shown uh, to the Men's Street Ministry through our giving so far. I thank you for those that we are able to help with our food pantry. I thank you for how our church is welcoming of those who show up on our doorstep and on a Sunday morning are able to come in and have a cup of coffee and we can just sit with them and talk with them in a way that they are recognized and treated well. We thank you for those opportunities we've had. And may we continue to find them, act upon them, and again, do our part. And may we do our part as we go out from here, in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our community involvement. We pray all of these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.